area of, neuro, uh, of neurological development in the nervous system in, in all mammals, um, probably in lots of vertebrates, um, there's a process where there's random overgrowth. In other words, way too many things are made, Ma way too many neurons, and then even among those neurons, way too many axons, way too many synapses. Everything's sort of overmade, sort of just thrown out there. <laughs> and then a selection process acts to prune these things away. The model that has held ever since this phenomenon was uncovered is that this is random overgrowth into the target field followed by a non-random process, selection, does this sound familiar, um, that generates a pattern. My point is not that any of us have ruled out determinism or guidance or anything like that in this process. It's simply that a developmental biologist, when talking about these phenomena, perfectly comfortable saying random fertilization. Random X inactivation. Random overgrowth followed by pruning. That's how we understand it. Developmental biology provides naturalistic explanation while acknowledging the existence of death, disfigurement, mutation, waste, failure, tragedy. We could go on and on. Uh, this, I'm not going to make light of this because I think you know what I'm doing here. I'm not going to make light of this concern. We are going to come back to the specific place where I think it matters in talking about theistic evolution. But... It's not true that, in, that any TE proceeds without ever worrying about or ever confronting this kind of stuff. It does. In fact, sometimes theistic embryology is trying to explain that, right, or that. But finally, interestingly, this TE seems to be uncontroversial. As of at least yesterday when I was Googling, I never found any institutes devoted to the destruction of theistic embryology. Not one. There are no ministries of any church in the, in the hemisphere that is devoted to the, to the ending of theistic embryology and its pernicious influence on our children's education. That's interesting to me. Because theistic embryologists make some pretty weird assumptions, don't they? They think that they think just about if everything can be naturally explained. They almost sound like atheists. They actually do think that there's such a thing as random fertilization, while simultaneously, out of the other side of their mouth, they're talking about how God ordained them from before the foundations of the earth. But no one seems too upset about that. Maybe this is your chance. Or maybe there's something weird going on. Why isn't theistic embryology... Um, you know, opposed. Maybe it should be, actually. Maybe I'll just get that ball rolling. <laughs> All right. Let me raise some objections to theistic embryology. Here's one. One might complain that it's too naturalistic in its approach and it should, quote, leave room for God, unquote. I didn't need Google to find that quote. One might complain that its acknowledgement of the supernatural makes it fundamentally unscientific. Have you heard that one? You will, if you haven't heard it yet. I'll show you where you can find it. Uh, looking at these kinds of objections, we might immediately recognize the, them to be basic questions about either faith or about naturalistic explanation and say, well, dude, you might be right, but that doesn't have anything to do with my theistic embryology. Are you uh, concerned about theistic embryology or are you just think belief is stupid? Are you concerned about theistic embryology, or do you just think that naturalistic explanation is, is, is overdone and you scientists need to rein it in and find some miracle places in embryology? Come out with it. If that's the problem, we can talk about it, but that's not a problem that has anything specific to do with theistic embryology, does it? I don't think so. All right, so with that, I decided let's, let's make this into a test. Maybe it'll find its way into a textbook or something. We'll call it the theistic embryology test. Maybe it could be the TE test. Now here's the test. I propose the theistic embryology test for discerning whether an objection to or critique of theistic evolution is really specific to theistic evolution. So simply take the objection to, to, to TE and apply it to all the TEs and see what happens. All right, so if you apply your problem with theistic evolution and just change a word or two and apply it to theistic embryology, maybe you'll discover it hits theistic embryology too, and that'll be telling you something important. That you're not annoyed about theistic evolution, that's not the problem. That your problem is you don't, you don't like God and, and you think he's evil, and I've met people like that, and maybe you have too, or your problem is uh, I don't like evolution, and that's cool too. 
Why would you single out the poor, innocent, theistic evolutionist while carrying on your... Yeah, okay, so... Now let's try our test and see if it works. Now here we're going to have to turn to the place where these battles are, are played out. So, now don't worry, I'm not... You might think I'm, I'm setting up straw persons here, but, but I would never do that. Well, let's go to the Answers in Genesis website and look at the ten dangers of theistic evolution... And I would like us to think of each of them in the context of the TE test. Uh, I don't think we'll go through all ten, because some of them are somewhat redundant, and a couple of them are just flat out wrong. But in each case, they're raising some kind of objection. Now, I don't know if you can read this, but here's the first one. Misrepresentation of the nature of God. Can we see it now? Nice. Uh, let's just go right here. Theistic evolution gives a false representation of the nature of God because death and ghastliness, I actually didn't know that was a word, um, are ascribed to the creator as principles of creation. First of all, right off the bat, this objection is revealed not to be a, an objection specifically to theistic evolution, and it's not. It also applies to pro progressive creationism. In fact, I think it applies to just about any view that has the earth be way older than 6,000 years. It's really hard to tell the story. I just want to say here, I think we have a little bit of both. Some of this is hitting, is hitting the wrong target, but it's awfully close to a really important target that is specific to theistic evolution that I'll come back to. So let's, right here, this idea of death, we, we, we can't get around that one. We're going to have to deal with that. All right, but let's see what number two says. God becomes a god of the gaps. In theistic evolution, and this is one of my major targets in this 10-minute talk, folks. It's, the one that's it's one of them that's mentioned in the abstract. In theistic evolution, the only workspace allotted to God is that part of nature which evolution cannot explain with the means presently at its disposal. In this way, he's reduced to being a God of the gaps for those phenomena about which there are doubts. This leads to the view that God is therefore not absolutely yada, yada, yada. All right. This, I think we can summarize this objection as follows. The problem with theistic evolution is that it uses naturalistic explanation. That's it. People. Every TE got hit by this one. Every single one. Theistic, anything you want. It doesn't have to start with E. If your discipline starts with J, it'll work. It's hit. Naturalistic, this, this, this objection is saying the problem with theistic blank is that the only workspace allowed to God is that part of nature which blank can I explain. That is not an objection to theistic evolution. That's an objection to naturalistic explanation. And let's hear it if you have that, but let's not call it an objection to theistic evolution. Um, let's see, some of them are really false, but I thought we would I'd look at number seven with you. Loss of biblical chronology. I'm going to come back to it. If you want to have a problem with theistic evolution, you should go to the Answers in Genesis webpage and copy and paste this, because this is it. This is the problem. So they hit a high point there. I'm like, yes, go, go, go. And then number eight says loss of creation concepts. This is interesting. It names a couple of concepts. Theistic evolution ignores all such creation principles and replaces them with evolutionary notions, thereby contradicting and opposing God's omnipotent acts of creation. That does sound suspiciously again to me like you mustn't replace naturalistic explanation for other things, and I think, again, almost any TE is going to founder on that one, and the TE test will, will fail. This one's interesting. Misrepresentation of reality. This one basically says, well, evolution is false, so you're lying. That's okay, well. Um, but finally, number 10 is called missing the purpose. And here's the key sentence right here. The very thought of purposelessness Purposefulness, sorry, is anathema to evolutionists. Evolutionary adaptations never follow a purposeful program. They thus cannot be regarded as teleonomical. That is a quote from an uh, obscure reference that I have never heard of. Thus, a belief system such as theistic evolution that marries purposefulness with non-purposefulness is a contradiction in terms. Um, you know, it's a much longer conversation to try to unpack the relationship between randomness and determinism and purpose. Those are different and overlapping concepts and some of us have been wrestling with them recently. It's not that easy. But let's just say that to whatever extent evolution embraces purposelessness, 
so does TE. 